Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Our first question is from Kezia Dovedale. To ask the Scottish Government how the Housing Minister aims to improve the transparency, accessibility and reporting of home adaptation funding. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, integration joint boards are responsible for the planning and delivery of adaptations. Uh, we are undertaking a review of existing legislation and guidance on adaptations. Uh, and this work has a practical focus, concentrating on identifying barriers and areas uh, for development. We intend to issue revised guidance to IJBs later this year uh, to ensure uh, that the tenure neutral person centred approach to adaptations that I want to see for all older and disabled people is happening consistently across the country. The Scottish Government publishes a range of information on expenditure on adaptations. I thank the Minister for that answer. He's aware that the Scottish Government cash for home adaptations has been frozen for seven years. Now that it's been absorbed into the IGBs, it's almost impossible to track the money in terms of the number of adaptations that take place or indeed the money spent. Given the clear link between the need for home adaptations and the demands on social care, does he agree that this urgently needs sorted out and we need to be able to follow the money and when can we expect to do that? Um, President Officer, I agree um, that we need to look at this in more depth and that's why uh, the review that I talked about is taking place. Um, obviously, the Scottish Government has provided uh, £10 million a year over a number of years uh, directly to uh, RSLs um, for adaptations, but primarily, um, uh, you know, this is additional man money, primarily uh, all of this rests with IJBs. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Jean Freeman, and I want to make sure that this is uh, done right, uh, is as open and transparent as it possibly can be, and that's why we agreed to undertake the review. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Parliament, I'll come back to Parliament, or Ms Freeman will come back to Parliament uh, with more uh, in-depth on that once that's completed. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thanks. Kezia Dugdale is absolutely right. It's uh, virtually impossible to follow the money under the current system, and that needs to be sorted out. Uh, but she mentioned that uh, money for adaptations has been frozen at £10 million for seven years. That's a real terms decrease of over a £1 million. Doesn't the Minister not think it's time to uh, increase that amount? Minister. As I, I said to Ms Dugdale uh, in my answer to her, uh, this is additional money. Uh, the, the primary responsibility um, for the budgeting of adaptations uh, rests with integrated uh, joint boards. They are the ones uh, who should be uh, ensuring uh, that people's uh, needs are met in this particular area. Um, uh, in uh, the, the last uh, year that we have figures for, 2016-17, uh, the total reported spend uh, by uh, IGBs was some £38.413 million. Pounds. I want to make sure that people know where this money is being spent. That's why we've agreed to, do, to undertake this review. That's why we've gone ahead with it. Uh, and uh, that is the right thing to do. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. I'd be grateful if the Minister could uh, inform me if he's had, had any discussions with the Scottish War Blinded, uh, who have got uh, various numbers of grants uh, and uh, funds available to actually help particular people uh, from the armed forces community who are blind and visually impaired. Minister. Um, President Officer, I'm aware of the excellent work of the Scottish War Blinded and other veterans charities in supporting and delivering services uh, to disabled veterans across Scotland. Um, the Government's Housing Voluntary Sector Grant uh, supports third sector organisations uh, committed to helping disabled people live independently at home. Uh, for example, Housing Options Scotland uh, operate Military Matters, uh, which focuses on housing matters affecting service personnel, veterans uh, and their families. Question number two, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, General Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason Transport Scotland requires disabled people to renew their national entitlement card every three years, including when they have a disability that is permanent or progressive. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Renewal is due on the grounds of disability as documentary evidence is required to show that the person remains eligible to access the scheme. While there are some conditions which will be permanent, in the majority of cases circumstances can change. I appreciate that renewal may be an inconvenience for those with a condition. However, these measures are designed to ensure that only those people who are eligible have access to the scheme. 
Stuart McMillan. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? When we asked Transport Scotland about the policy, they said it was to ensure fairness for all disabled people, all disabled people are treated fairly. But how does a costly, demeaning and unnecessary process fit with the Scottish Government's ethos of treating people with dignity and respect? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the member will be aware that the scheme does not operate on a condition-specific basis. Therefore, it has to operate in an equitable fashion uh, for the 1.4 million people who have access to uh, the existing national entitlement card, uh, which is to ensure that it is only applied to those and provided to those who are entitled to it. The member uh, should also be aware, um, uh, because he certainly didn't reflect that in his uh, supplementary question, is that the renewal process is a simplified process, uh, which is very different from the reapplication process in order to reduce the burden uh, for individuals who are seeking to have a renewal of their card. So the process has been simplified in order to make it much easier for those who are seeking a renewal. And Kenneth Gibson. Hey, thank you, presiding officer. I have a constituent born with disabilities so severe that throughout her life she's been incapable of work or forming meaningful relationships. Her sibling deals with everything for her. Yet the UK Tory government has subjected her to nine employment support allowance work capability assessments over the years. Even at 62, she was summoned to appear at Job Centre Plus in Air, many miles from her home for another. In this light, does the Cabinet Secretary agree? agree that it takes a shocking lack of self-awareness yeah. for Tory MSPs to come to this chamber and complain about national entitlement card renewal terms. That question is rather <laughs> wide of the mark, so a very, very brief response, Mr Minister. Uh, so no, sir, I do think it's an utter disgrace that constituents such as Kenny Gibson's have been put through such a degrading process. Uh, and the process which was used by the DWP is in no way similar to the process we use for the national entitlement card, which is a simplified process in order to make sure it's a dignified process for those who are applying for it. Question number three, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what information it can provide regarding the findings of Police Scotland's recent visit to Vietnam. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Since 2014, Vietnamese nationals have been the most frequently uh, reported potential victims of trafficking through the national referral mechanism in Scotland. Labour exploitation was the most common exploitation types for both adults and children, but experience of multiple exploitation appears common both in transit uh, and indeed on arrival. The National Human Trafficking Unit was invited by Every Child Protected Against Trafficking to participate in a two-part best practice exchange with Vietnam. Uh, police Scotland met with represent representatives from the Vietnamese police, uh, the Ministry of Public Security to discuss options for collaborative work in furtherance of the recently signed MOU between the UK government uh, and the Vietnamese government. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, children arrive in Scotland from Vietnam on their own with no parent or anyone to look after them. Trafficked here to be exploited sexually for their labour in nail bars and in cannabis farms in Scotland. Unaccompanied children are extremely vulnerable. That is why the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act provided that the Scottish Guardianship Service would step in to give these children legal protection. But three and a half years on, the Scottish Government has not yet enacted this provision. Vietnamese and other trafficked children still don't have a Scottish legal guardian that this government promised them. Why is this, Cabinet Secretary? And if you commit today to enacting Section 11, will you also please meet with me to discuss the scope of Section 11, as there are concerns that the government will interpret it too narrowly and the will of Parliament to protect vulnerable children will not be fully realised by your government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, can, I, can I first recognise uh, the work that Jenny Mara uh, has, has done in the interest that she's uh, taken uh, in this issue, and of course, we're very proud of that, uh, you know, breaking that legislation uh, on, on independent child uh, traffic, uh, traffic and guardian, which will take forward in Section 11. What I would say to Jenny Mara is, of course, I, I will meet with her. Uh, and, of course, the Minister for Children and Early Years will be happy to meet with her, who's leading on this particular section of the Act. I, I do have some issue with the characterisation of the support. There is support available for unaccompanied children. It's through the Scottish Guardianship Service. I visited that uh, service which is provided by the Scottish Refugee Council in Aberlour uh, and of course gets £300,000 of Scottish Government funding. That works with and has worked with almost 400 young people uh, since its inception in 2010. So let's not, uh, let's not make the assumption that there's no support there for young people. There absolutely is. But the, prob the, the point that she raises actually is a very valid one. She asked me to meet with her because she has issues in and around the scope of Section 11. Because of those issues, actually, it's taken a bit longer to draft 
the consultation, but that consultation will be ready to go out in Section 11 uh, in spring. If she wishes to meet with me or indeed the Minister for Children uh, in, in early years, uh, once that consultation has gone out or indeed before that, then of course we are happy uh, to have that conversation. Question number four, Alison Harris. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce abuse against elderly people. Minister Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank Alison Harris for that question? Abuse in our communities is unacceptable. No person should ever be subject to any form of abuse. We have made the ill treatment and willful neglect of adults receiving health and social care a criminal offence and are currently consulting on the hate crime legislation, including the introduction of a statutory sentencing aggravation of age-related hostility. Alison Harris. I, I thank you for that answer, but recently in my region, several elderly people were abused by a member of staff at a care home facility. This ranged from degrading humiliation to physical abuse. No one should have to go through this, and elderly people are particularly vulnerable. However, the culprit was only sentenced to 90 hours of unpaid work. Does the Minister agree with me that crimes like this should be treated more seriously? Minister. Um, uh, absolutely, and that's the reason why when in my opening uh, remarks I um, explained to Alison Harris that we're currently consulting on an age-related hosti hostility aggravation in the hate crime legislation. You, sh she will know that the, the Care Commission um, have done some work around this and also that everyone in Scotland has a right to a safe, compassionate, high-quality care which meets their needs and respects their rights. And in respecting those rights, we have to look at what Lord Brackadale has recommended in his um, a, um, work that he has done for us and consult on that. And I would encourage every member in here to encourage their local people to get involved in that consultation so that we can take forward some of the issues that older people face when it comes to vulnerability and the hostility and the hate crime around their age. And David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be well aware that Action and Elder Abuse gave evidence to the Justice Committee in February and they believe the real reason older people are targeted is due to their perceived vulnerability. Is Scotland meeting its international human rights commitments towards older people? And finally, should there be a specific offence of elder abuse? Yes. Uh, again, can I thank um, uh, Dave Stewart for that, that, that question? And it, it ties into the, to the answer to the last question. The vulnerability is a very, very clear um, um, theme that we, we are working on through Lord Brackadale's recommendations. He, rec he recognised that older people can be targeted and perpetrators uh, can target them because of the perception of their, their age and their vulnerability. So vulnerability is a very clear aspect in where we're looking at and the consultation has looked at age-related hostility and within that is about age and vulnerability. So we're very happy to hear any other comments that it has on that. But absolutely, uh, we're taking this forward with a serious mind. Thank you. Question number five, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Scottish Prison Service carries out of prisoners when they're first convicted. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Uh, every person who is received into a Scottish prison, whether on remand or conviction, is subject to a multi-tiered assessment process. Uh, they will get a reception risk assessment conducted by SPS staff. Uh, that identifies immediate requirements and risks relating to social care, self-harm, addictions. They'll get a healthcare assessment, which is carried out by NHS professionals. Uh, and for those that are serving more than seven days, they'll get a further core screen, which is conducted. Uh, individuals are also asked if they have children or dependents and whether they've served in the military. Neil Findlay. Uh, the prison population is uh, very disproportionately made up of people who on conviction are in poverty, experiencing addiction or homelessness, yet the Scottish Prison Service, uh, nor the Scottish Government, can tell us how many people were in these circumstances prior to going to prison. So how can we possibly address these very serious issues when we have no idea of the extent of the problem? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank Neil Finlay uh, for raising the question again? I, I take some issue with the characterisation, but I think the general point that he's making is absolutely a, a, a very valid one. Uh, there is a lot of people in our prisons that have addictions, that have issues around uh, their housing situation, that have issues around their mental health, that frankly, uh, when it comes to those issues, if they were addressed, they would probably not be bearing into the criminal justice system at all. We have a shared responsibility, and of course the government takes that responsibility on uh, around looking at interventions before they get into the criminal justice to do, uh, system to deal with these issues. The second point I'd make, which I think is a very valid one that Neil Findlay raises, is that we need to get better at the information sharing between social work, between the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, between uh, the Scottish Prison Service 
and other agencies. And to give them the reassurance, uh, I've asked for a meeting uh, of those agencies and indeed for our Justice Board, which makes up those stakeholders and many more, to examine this information sharing because the more information we have in an individual, the better our interventions can be, the better our interventions, the more chance there is of rehabilitation. The more chance there is of rehabilitation, the less chance there is of victims and of crime. So therefore, we have safer communities uh, for all. Liam MacArthur. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged, uh, mental health checks in our prisons are essential, yet only two mental health professionals have been added to the prison workforce since more were promised in March 2017. Meantime, both the prison population and self-harm incidents have soared. Is the Cabinet Secretary concerned that we may actually have seen a decrease per head in access to mental health services in our prisons? And how many of the 800 extra mental health workers will be allocated to the prison estate? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Liam uh, MacArthur for raising uh, this question? Again, acknowledge his interest uh, in this particular issue. Again, I'll try to give him a couple of reassurances. Uh, the first is to say that um, the processes that SPS have in relation to identifying practices of self-harm has greatly improved. In 2017, uh, there was a, a, a further quality assurance process. And it'd be fair to say that, that some, of, some of the rising numbers we see uh, are actually because the reporting mechanism is a lot better, uh, perhaps, than in previous years. But that's not to say that there aren't issues in their own self-harm uh, in our prison. We are dealing with often very complex is uh, issues and, and complex individuals. Uh, myself and the Health Secretary and the Minister for Mental Health have a regular conversation uh, about the needs uh, in prisons. There is, of course, as he will know, a mental health uh, review taking place, which will look at uh, mental health provision within prisons. But also what I would say to him is a specific issue of, of our young people, he'll be aware that there's a review ongoing in Pullman in relation to the mental health uh, provision therein. And, and of course, I will report to Parliament uh, once that review has been completed. Question number six, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Scott Rail and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I last met with Alex Hines, Managing Director of Scott Rail Alliance, on the 23rd of January and will meet him on the 24th of April. My officials remain in regular and constant liaison with ScotRail about a full range of operational issues which requires to be delivered by ScotRail. Claire Baker. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the packed public meeting in Kirkcaldy a few weeks ago organised by Leslie Laird MP with Alex Hines from ScotRail where five travellers strongly expressed their frustration and their anger with delayed, cancelled and overcrowded trains. Commuters were told at this meeting not to expect the peak time service to return to normal until at least December. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that five commuters are being badly let down by this appalling service? And will he work with ScotRail to deliver a cut in fares until services return to normal in recognition of the unacceptable service that fifers are experiencing? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, the member will be aware that we have raised concerns with ScotRail regarding their performance on the Fife Circle and also in other parts of the network in Scotland, which is why we triggered them the issuing of a remedial notice, which was issued to uh, ScotRail on the 24th of December, which now requires them to bring forward a remedial plan, which has been submitted to the Scottish Government to Transport Scotland to be considered. And we are now at the very advanced stages of entering that into a remedial agreement. That is specifically about addressing the concerns that her constituents and others who have experienced disruption with ScotRail's performance, that these issues are addressed on a consistent, ongoing basis. A key part of that, though, is about making sure that they get access to the rolling stock, which will help to improve uh, performance, including additional capacity on routes such as in Fife, which has been delayed because of failures by Wabtec to have the refurbishment work carried out and also the delays being caused by Hitachi in the delivery of the new 385 uh, trains as well, all of which have had a systematic impact on the process. However, notwithstanding that, it's important we make sure that ScotRail have been held to account through the contract that they have with us for providing rail services, and that's exactly what the remedial plan is about doing, and we'll publish details of that in the coming days. Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will indeed be aware from my regular correspondence with him uh, that my constituents, I have to say this, quite frankly, are absolutely fed up with ScotRail's Five Circle service. Has the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, has the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, received any up-to-date information from ScotRail, who are responsible for this mess, that would indicate that there is indeed any light at the end of the tunnel? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, officer, I fully recognise the frustration which our constituents have over a consistent period of time of uh, poor performance across the uh, Fife Circle. And as I mentioned in my earlier response, that's the very reason, one of the reasons why we triggered uh, the issuing of a remedial notice to ScotRail in order to develop a remedial plan, not to address these very issues that our, constituent has, uh, our constituents are experiencing. And we're now at that very advanced stage of entering into that remedial agreement with ScotRail in order to make sure that it is effectively implemented and addresses the types of concerns which our constituents have. And we will announce more details of that in the coming days. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. And uh, before we move on to First Minister's questions, could I invite members to join me in welcoming to our gallery Talat Zaferi MP, President of the Assembly of the Republic of North Macedonia. 